We all search for that spark which fuels our desire to fully engage in our lives. We look for the courage to experience moments where we can come alive instead of watching life pass us by. You're listening to The Front Row Factor, leaving fear and insecurity behind by exploring stories of top performers that are living life in the front row. Get ready to stand up, step up, and live it up with your host, John Vroman. Hey everybody, John Broman here. Welcome to the Front Row Factor podcast where we talk to people living life in the front row. Today's conversation is with Aaron Walker, businessman and life coach. You can check him out at viewfromthetop.com. Aaron is a guy who has 35 years of entrepreneurial experience. He has built and sold very successful businesses. Uh, We talked today on the show about the power of masterminds and how he's been in a mastermind for the last 20 years with an amazing group, including Dave Ramsey, a name I'm sure you're familiar with. Aaron is a married guy, has children and grandkids. He really has his priorities in order. We talked to him about the power of success and significance, how to define those and let them live out in our lives. And we even get into a tragic moment that Aaron experienced in his life that would transform the way he would think about himself and the world forever. This is a great show. I know you're going to totally dig it. And before I get into it with Aaron, I want to challenge you to do one thing. And that is ask yourself as you listen to the show, uh, who can I share this show with? Think about what individual in your life would benefit from being connected to Aaron and his community and all of what he brings to the table. So many times when I listen to a podcast, I'll ask myself the question, who can I share this with? And I'll text it out, I'll email it out, but I'm constantly trying to introduce ideas and people to those in my life that I care about the most. So do that today. That's your challenge. Enjoy this show with Aaron Walker of viewfromthetop.com. All right, front row, we are here with Mr. Aaron Walker of View From The Top. How you doing, Aaron? I'm doing great, John. How about yourself? Uh, well, I'm I'm really honored to have you on the show, and I'm such a fan of yours. Uh, we've talked offline a bit. I was exposed to you the first time through Larry Hagner and Sean Stevenson, and I remember listening to your interview on a run, a trail run, and I had just had such a great feeling as I listened to your story, and uh, I was so excited about the possibility of sharing you with the Front Row community. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Larry's a great guy. He's recently joined our mastermind group. And so the Good Dad Project is awesome. And he is just a fabulous guy. Sean Stevenson is good. And those guys are just a joy and a delight to be with as well. But I am so happy that they've connected me with you. So I'm excited about this interview today. Thank you for having me. Oh, great. Aaron, let's start with a quick highlight reel of what's going on in your world. There's so much good happening right now. You're contributing in such a massive way. And I know you're connecting with some really incredible people in your community, both people that I know are you're learning from and you're coaching so many others. So can you give us a, a little peek into what what's the good happening in Aaron Walker? As well? <laughs> There's so much good. I don't even know where to start. We need about two or three hours to do this interview instead of 45 minutes. That's right. But the thing that's exciting for me is, first of all, John, I wasn't even going to coach, right? I wasn't even going to do View from the Top. I wasn't going to do the masterminds. I wasn't going to do the community. And my mastermind group that has Dan Miller and Dave Ramsey and Ken Abraham, Jeff Mosley, some of those guys, you may or might not know who they are. They said, man, you can't sit on the front porch and rock yourself to sleep at 50 years old. That was five years ago. And so they encouraged me to start coaching and I dabbled in it for a minute. You know, I said, well, I'll I'll teach and mentor a couple of guys. And those guys led to another guy that led to another guy. My schedule filled up pretty quick. I was on John Lee Dumas the first time entrepreneur on fire. My schedule filled up immediately. And I said, well, there's got to be other ways to help guys because you can't scale one-on-one, right? I only got so many hours. That's right. And so we started the mastermind groups, Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind Groups. And those filled up pretty quick too. Now facilitate six mastermind groups on a weekly basis. And that's really fun. And then I thought, you know, everybody can't afford one-on-one. Everybody can't afford Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind Groups, you know? And so I started the community and the community is inexpensive. It's like $37 a month. And now we got guys all over the world joining our community. So we have hundreds of guys now that are connecting, kind of following my message of how to live a successful and a significant life. By the way, my book, View from the Top, comes out in the summer. And I'm really excited about that. We're going to be telling how you also can have a view from the top. 
And I'm just pretty fired up right now, John, about <laughs> all that's going on. It's just been phenomenal to see the transformations and to see ordinary guys become extraordinary. And that's yeah. my mission in life, to live on purpose. Ah, oh, that's so great. And you know what's what's so cool, Aaron, is I love that you're you're the one who's who's leading and making such an impact in so many lives because of who you genuinely are at your core. It was obvious to me from the second I heard your voice the first time and learned your story, which we're going to get into in just a moment. I, I can't wait for you to share it with the community. They'll be talking about my voice because it's Southern <laughs> accent. It's I, great. <laughs> I, I did 176 interviews last year and I listened to one of them. And I laid on my office floor at home with my wife and listened to it. And I went, oh, God, please don't tell me that's me. <laughs> and they said, hey, you are what you are. And I said, I'll never listen to another interview. I thought, how country am I? And so anyway, we had a lot of fun with that. You're perfect. Aaron, well, first I want to make an observation here. What I think is so great and so many entrepreneurs and business folks can relate to this is you started serving and uh, you you, sh- you shared your story. You started serving in these one-to-one coaching conversations and then it naturally led to the mastermind and naturally led to this community development. I think that's so great. And I think that for many people, it feels like you might've built this all overnight but you, you've been taking one piece of the puzzle at a time. Let me just lead off with a quick question, which is, do you struggle with you know, the idea of biting off too much, biting off more than you can chew? And, and how do you know when to t- take on multiple projects and when to focus in on one particular project? Yeah, I learned a long time ago that uh, it's hard to multitask. It's hard to give 100% to two things, right? I mean, you can't yeah. do that. And so I'm very intentional about the projects that we start. I want to be an inch wide and a mile deep. You know, Greg McCowan wrote a great book called Essentialism, and he tells us in that book that most people try to do seven to ten things well, and we only have so much energy. But when you get laser focused and you can take that same amount of energy that we all have and apply it to one or two things, then instead of being an inch deep and a mile wide, we can then become an inch wide and a mile deep. And I want to be really proficient at whatever it is I'm doing. So I'll look at the overarching picture of everything and say, in order to get there incrementally, I've got to do these things. And if you don't do those things well, you may not get the opportunity to do the next part of it. And so really focus your effort and energy on one thing at a time. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Aaron, talk, talk to us a little bit about your story. Uh, you know, as you know, and you're familiar with the Front Row Foundation, we've talked about it. Uh, this all began with uh, helping people to live life in the front row, and particularly people that have a life-threatening illness. And so these are critical days, you know, making the most of every day that we're here. And this back row to front row uh, is, is when we transform. It's when we step up in our lives. It's when we own our strengths. We own our brilliance. We give our best to the world. We're fully engaged. And uh, this is a proximity is power, as Tony Robbins has brilliantly put it, type of metaphor. When we get close to our our big goals and dreams and we make magic happen. Can you tell us a little bit about your life yeah. and maybe where you transformed from back row to front? Yeah, I've got to go way back, right? Because I've been an entrepreneur now 38 years. I told someone the other day, I haven't wow. had a paycheck from a company uh, since I was 18. I'm 55 now, right? I had to go out and get it on my own. I wanted to do that. I started at 13 years old working in a local pawn shop. At 18 years old, I met a couple of guys that had a lot of money here in Nashville because I didn't have any. We came from a very, very humble beginnings. My dad mm-hmm. probably never made over $15,000 a year in his life. We lived in an 800-square-foot house with four kids. And so my dad was an honorable man, had high character and integrity, honest to a fault, but he was a horrible businessman. He didn't know anything about business. And so I said, well, in order for me to do better, I've got to get in some circles of people that know about business. Introduced myself to a couple of guys that had a lot of money. We formed a partnership and we opened our first business, John, at 18 years old. And I thought, hot dog. I said, this is going to be good. (laughs) I said, I can't mess this up. I've only got one shot at it. You know, I got to do a good job. So we started our first pawn shop at 18 years old here in Nashville. 12 months later, I got married to Robin. She graduated from high school. Two weeks later, we got married. And so we were on this venture together. And we said, listen, we may never get an opportunity like this again. And we want to be sure that we delay our gratification for short term. And we want to invest for the long haul. And so we took the money and we started applying it back to the business to pay it off. We paid off a 10-year loan in 36 months. 
And that takes a lot of focus, wow. intensity to do that. God really blessed our business, and we went and bought a second store. We did the same thing with that. We kept our lifestyle very minimal. We lived in a very small condo when we first got married. Then we bought a $79,000 house. We lived in for years. We kept taking the money, putting it back into the business because we wanted to build something that would pay you know, residual income long term. I could take mm-hmm. the money and go out and get a great big house and do all these elaborate trips and buy nice cars. I didn't want to live like that, though, so we continued to apply the money to the business. So now I'm 25 years old. We buy our third store, same way we pay it off. Then I buy a fourth store. I'm 27 years old. And there's a company in Fort Worth, Texas called Cash America. They're a Fortune 500 company. They wanted to be in Nashville, and they came to me. I just built a brand-new 10,000-square-foot building, and I just bought another building on Knowles Road in Nashville, and things were good. I mean, business was awesome. Things were good. And they said, we want to buy your business. And I said, well, I never even thought about selling the business. And they said, well, you've got the best stores in Nashville, and we want your stores. And I said, well, they're not for sale. And they said, everything's for sale. I said, these pawn shops are not for sale. (laughs) And so they left, and they were pretty adamant, you know. And I didn't really realize who I was talking to, just to be honest with you. They're kind of the beast, you know. So they came back, and they made another offer to buy me out. Not monetarily, just the offer to buy me. And it made me mad. And I said, listen, I'm not for sale. They left, came back about 90 days, and they said, Mr. Walker, everything's for sale. And I thought about it for a minute. I thought, well, this is my opportunity to get rid of them. So I'm sitting in my office, and uh, they said, hypothetically, if you were going to sell this store, what would you take? So I thought about it for a minute, and I said a number. And they went, we'll take it. (laughs) And I started laughing. That's incredible. And I said, well, I got to think about it. And they said, no, you've (laughs) priced it, and we've agreed to buy it. So I called my bank, and I went to Rob, and we talked, and you know, we all agreed this would be a good opportunity for me. So I sold the company, you know, about wow. 90 days. I was out of there and I woke up 27 years old. I didn't have to work anymore. And I thought, man, this is awesome. Well, what mm-hmm. I didn't know, John, is that money just by itself is not meaningful and purposeful. I was mm-hmm. getting in the bed after 18 months in the middle of the day. I gained 50 pounds in 18 months. I was bored, I was depressed. Robin woke me up one day, and I was getting in the bed, not on the bed, not on the couch taking a nap. I was getting in the bed, and she woke me up, and I said, I'm I'm bored. I'm depressed. And everybody says, well, you know, playing golf every day, fishing every day. Well, listen, that's fun for a little while. Sure. But you can only do that so much, right? And then it doesn't become fun anymore because you're not looking forward to doing something. Used to, I'd look forward to playing golf or going fishing because I'm working real hard. It's an outlet. But when you can do it anytime you want to, there's no restraints at all with your schedule. You've got the money to go wherever you want. It doesn't give you that sense of excitement like it once did. And I thought it would. And so I started another business. We grew it four times the size that it was when I bought it. Over the next 10 years, I had a dream schedule. I worked three hours a day. I mean, uh, three days a week, and my partner worked the other three days a week. And then my life changed, John. You're talking about going from the back row to the front row, and I did it in a very tragic way. August 1st, 2001, I was driving to the office. Things were good. A pedestrian was crossing the street to catch a bus, a four-lane highway. He was crossing the two northbound lanes. I was going south. He hesitated for a moment in the center lane. He looked my way, didn't see me, ran out. And I ran over and killed a pedestrian crossing the street. Oh, my gosh. I stopped on the side of the road. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even dial 911. My hands, and I'm thinking, God, this didn't really just happen. And so everything, John, I don't know if you've been in a very, very traumatic situation before, but everything slows down to like you're watching a video. It's like an out-of-body experience. It's like you're watching it happen. And I couldn't believe that was happening to me. And so I'm thinking that really didn't happen. And I turned and looked. Cars were stopping everywhere. I looked, and there was a, a man laying face down in the street. And I'm emotional. I get out of the car, and I run over an ambulance. Police cars come, and they pick him up. They look at him and they say, this is very, very serious. And so we go through the process. You know, I sit in the police car for a couple hours. I give my testimony. Other people give their testimony. And they said, he ran out in front of me. It wasn't his fault. 
And so uh, Enrique was his name. He was 77 years old. He was from the Philippines. He happened to be a good friend of my personal physician. My personal physician called the family, said, these are good people. I'm certain it was an accident. I called the family, paid my condolences. And so my wife comes home. She's in Florida on a mission trip with her daughters. And uh, I said, we got to talk. And I said, I've been chasing money my whole career since I was 13 years old. 18, my first store, sold out at 27 to a Fortune 500 company. I'm 40 years old now. We've built this business. I said, I'm selling out, finished. I'm completely done. I'm retiring. So I did. Sold the company to my partner. And Robin and I spent the next five years traveling. We built another house, changed locations. I had to have a different view. And so, again, she woke me up in the middle of the day. She goes, you're getting fat and lazy again. It's time to go back to work. So we started a construction company, and we built houses, uh, high-end residence, and small commercial for the next eight years. And we took that company to number one three consecutive years in Middle Tennessee. And then when I turned 50, I retired forever. I said, I'm finished, and here I am back again. I said, I've retired more than the law allows. You know, it's against the law for a person <laughs> to retire three times. But the transformation for me when I went from the back row to the front row was that day, July 1st, 2001, when I went from not only looking at my life from a successful standpoint, but to a significant standpoint. I started thinking, mm. what have I been doing? What is the purpose yeah. and the meaning for making all this money? Why am I doing that? I've got a mountain house, and then we bought a place on the beach in Destin, and I had a big house here and nice cars. There's nothing wrong with stuff. I love stuff, and I don't want to uh, diminish having things. I want you to be successful. I'm, I'm doing well now. I love to do well. I love to make money, but I don't want to make it my God, and it was mm. early on. I started thinking, how can I pour back into the community, right? How can I give rather than take? Adam Grant wrote a great book called Givers and Takers. We're one or the other. Well, I was the taker, and I wanted to become the giver. And so yeah. now I spend each and every day looking outward, trying to help other people realize their dreams and their goals. Simultaneously, I like making money so I can do the things and be beneficial and helpful to those around me. So that day, quite honestly, I went from the back row to the front row. It was just a struggle in the process to get there. It was a traumatic event that took me there. And I don't want people to go through a traumatic event to get there. I want them to intellectually say, I can live a life of success and significance. I just got to do it on purpose. Yeah. And Aaron, do you think, um, thank you, by the way, for sharing that story. There's a lot there in that story. And, and I want to honor you, by the way, for the way that you've chosen to live today. Can you tell us a little bit about when you say significance, how do you define that? What does that mean? What does it mean yeah. to live a significant life? Yeah. I think two things we've got to decide, first of all, is not only significance, but success. And I had to make the determination for me personally, what is success even anyway, right? What is it? Yeah, how will sure. you know when you've won, right? Like, how will I know when I've achieved whatever it is that you're looking for? Most people don't know. I even wrote a document called, What Do I Want? And I asked questions like, if there was nothing geographically uh, hindering you or financially, what would you do with your life tomorrow? And a lot right. of people, most people can't answer that question. So I had to sit and think, what is success to me? And I started thinking about, well, first of all, I like to make money, right? It does some cool things for you. You can take trips. You can pay the electric bill without having to worry about it. And so it does give you a sense of security, certain amount of finance. You know, there's uh, studies that have been done that from zero to $70,000, there's a great amount of exuberance or happiness that we get from having money. But once you pass about $70,000, it's very, very minuscule the amount of happiness that we That's get right. as a direct result of finances. It's what we do with it. So my personal schedule, I love being able to get up and go, you know, I think I'll do this today, or I think I'll do that. For me, that's success. The bigger success for me, though, is having an engaging family. I love my family. My wife is absolutely number one. Carnally speaking, Christ is number one, my faith. My wife is number one, carnally speaking. Then my two daughters and then my five grandchildren. My two daughters work for me in my office. They're both my assistants. 
I get to see them every day, and that's a blast. Mm -hmm. We live five minutes from all of our grandchildren. My daughters live across the street from each other, so my kids are grandkids are getting oh, wow. raised like their brothers and sisters. So life is good from a family standpoint, but that's paramount. The significance piece, though, is something that takes more thought. It's like, what can I do in order for other people's lives to be better as a result of knowing me, right? Mm -hmm. That's what happens at the end of the day. It's like you can do these things, you can get these houses, these cars, these objects, these possessions, but nobody cares, right? It's because it's all about you, and that's what I was doing. It was all about me. But when I start thinking about how can I make John's life better, what connection could I do? Could I promote his product? Could I give him a word of encouragement? Could I endorse him? Could I sit at my computer and do a LinkedIn profile uh, endorsement? Could I send out a video saying, John, front row is the bomb. These guys are awesome without you asking me for it. Like, what right. can I do to propel you? Well, as a direct result, the reciprocity of that, people want to be around you. They want to buy your product. They want to buy your services. So for me, it's helping people move themselves forward to achieve their goals and dreams. The second thing is, is helping people when it's not convenient. We're all right. busy, right? You even said, first thing, I want to respect your time because I know you're busy. Well, we're all busy, right? Yeah. But when it's not convenient is when you'll know you're really interested in helping that person. The second thing yeah. is, is helping people that can't repay you. Oh, uh, yeah. So used to, I would do things with the motive, man, I'll do this for John and introduce him to him because he'll introduce me to this guy or he'll, you know, my motives now need to be pure. We go through some exercises that helps us do that. One is I'll take my grandchildren, we'll go to Waffle House and we'll anonymously pick up tables and we'll say, hey, bring mm -hmm. us their check. <laughs> or we'll go to the nursing home like on a Friday and we'll hand out chocolate or we'll go to the hospital and we'll give donuts in the waiting rooms, right? Those people... First of all, we say we can't tell them who we are, right? That's the first rule. Right. I go and do random acts of kindness. I'm not saying this to boast. I'm saying that we do this to keep ourselves in check. Every time I go to Starbucks, I'm buying somebody's coffee anonymously or picking up their dinner or doing whatever. And people tell me all the time when I, after I do these interviews, they'll say, you know what, Aaron, if I had your kind of money, I would do that too. And John, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a little pushback on that because money doesn't change your heart. It magnifies what's already there. That's right. And if we're not doing it now at some level, it doesn't cost money to give a smile. It doesn't cost money That's right. to help people at the nursing home. See, we can give our time. It's not just about money. And so money magnifies what's in the heart. You can do bigger things. You can do more things. You can do scholarships or endowments or larger random acts of kindness. You can do those things, but you got to start where you're at today to be significant. And then the last thing that I do from a significant standpoint is I want to not only look at Friday, but I want to be able to change things generationally for people. I want to be able to look down the road far enough that it doesn't only make an impact in their life, but in their children's children's life. And when we do that, we've been significant. Uh, that's that's just great. I love it. <laughs> Aaron, I could listen to you talk for a long time. There was a part of me that was thinking, I hope he just doesn't stop talking. I just, this whole interview could be you talking and me listening. Uh, and this my would be- My wife tells me to shut up. This would be great. Times. Okay, this is my chance. I'm out of the house so I can talk. That's but right. Anyway. Aaron, I want to talk a little bit about the who and the what piece of, in our community, what we call in your front row. So who's in your front row are the people that you surround yourself with, one of the most important decisions we'll ever make. And I know that's really important to you as a guy who is facilitating these mastermind groups. And I want to come back to that masterminding in just a moment. And then there's the what's in your front row, which is your environment. And, and I believe you said at some point here, you were talking about how you were shifting your environment. You had to change your your, I think you were talking about your home, but you were talking about literally shifting an environment. And I think that the view from the top is a shift of environment. You know, it's putting yourself in a different location to be able to see the world differently, you know, literally or figuratively. I want to talk for a moment about the who's in your front row. And can you expand a little bit on the mastermind concept? Because I know that for me, uh, personally, I've struggled with wanting to know, should I join a mastermind group? Should I start a mastermind group? And if I'm doing either of those two, who should be in it? And I know that it's be the, you know, there's a saying, it's, um, I don't know who to quote for this, but, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. 
And it's the idea of surrounding yourself with people that are playing a bigger game than you. But I think there's a lot of questions for me and probably for a lot of other people around who do we hang out with? How do we connect with them? I know you've been in a mastermind group with some names that we might know. <laughs> yeah, but let's go there. Let's, let's stop right there. That's a good place yeah. to start. Okay, so first of all, 1995... I met Dave Ramsey, right? And a lot of people know me for being, you know, with Dave Ramsey and Mastermind now for two decades. But the point is, is Dave Ramsey gave me advertising at my business to try him because no one had ever heard of him. Okay, right. now that's important for us to talk about. And let me tell you why. People say all the time, well, yeah, I'd be in a Mastermind too if I was in there with Dave Ramsey. He wasn't the Dave Ramsey 20 years ago that he is today, right? Sure. There were three people working for Dave when I met him, and he was on one radio station in Nashville, Tennessee. He lives in my city. And he had to introduce himself. I'd never heard of him, okay? So my point being, it doesn't have to be the Dave Ramseys and the Dan Millers of the world in order to mastermind. We were all a bunch of knuckleheads trying to figure out our businesses and trying to grow them together. What's important is, is that we're with people of like mind, there is never a truer saying than we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. There is nothing more true than that statement. And the point is, is you are going to start acting like the people that you're around. And that's the reason I used to tell my kids, you know, you hang around with that person long enough, some of that's going to rub off on you, whether it's good or bad. And you better pick your friends wisely. You better pick them carefully. So we got together, these 10 guys did, in Dave's office. We met in his conference room. We came every week, every Wednesday from 7 to 7.30. You did not get an appointment with me. I scheduled my time from 6 to 10 on Wednesdays for over a decade. Mm. I didn't do anything but drive to Dave's office, meet with the 10 guys, and drive back. And that was where I spent every Wednesday morning for over a decade, 10 or 12 years. We did that in this group. So you have to be committed. That's the important thing. When I first started out with the group, it was real awkward to me. Dave invited me to the group. He knew a lot of the guys in the group, and I didn't know anybody. And it felt awkward to me at first. It was like, hey, I don't know these guys. And it took a while to warm up to those guys. Well, as a result of that, we started doing life together. We celebrated birthdays, weddings, deaths. You know, we've flown across the country to different funerals. We've been there for each other. You build this camaraderie. You build this... Uh, this friendship that's inseparable because you have trusted advisors that are non-biased, okay? You can't get that with a partner because they're biased, naturally. You can't get that with a family member because they want what's best for you. But when you have somebody that has nothing to gain, they have nothing to lose to tell you the truth, now you're going to get an honest answer. I used to go in there and they go, do more of this, do less of this. You got to quit doing that. You got to quit being so arrogant or cocky or hateful. You need to be more friendly, more giving. And they didn't have anything to gain or lose. James Ryle called me. He passed away about six months ago here in Nashville, one of our members. And he called me one day and I was at Ace Hardware. And he goes, I got a message for you. And I thought, but oh, this is going to be really good. This guy travels all over the world. He's a promise keeper speaker. He's phenomenal. Best storyteller I've ever heard. And it was during a rough time in my personal life. I was going through a very, very dark spot and I couldn't get over it. I don't know, John, if you've ever been there or not, if you've ever been in a spot, you just couldn't whip. You just could not oh, yeah, get over it. So absolutely. I get a phone call. I'm at Ace Hardware in Hendersonville on a Saturday morning. We never talk to each other during the week. I mean, the weekend. We're always during the week because we respect each other's you know, family time. Sure. So I look at my phone and I go, oh, this is James. And I thought immediately, this is going to be really good or this is going to be really bad, one or the other, Yeah. right? right? So I answered the phone. James goes, Aaron, have you got a minute? And I thought, yeah, hold on. Let me walk out to the parking lot. I said, uh, it's kind of loud in here. I can't hear you. I walk out to the parking lot, and I'm excited. I'm like amped up walking outside because I know he's got a word for me. He said, I was praying for you this morning, and God gave me a word for you. And I thought, man, this is like he can almost walk on water. This is going to be like a, a prophecy for my life. And I, I'm excited. And I said, okay, I'm ready. What is it? And he goes, you're wearing the hell out of everybody in our group. <laughs> and I'm like, I start laughing just like you did. And I said, what? And he goes, I'm serious, man. He goes, when are you going to get over this thing? He said, you just keep on talking about it. You just keep going over and over. We're sick mm -hmm. of hearing about it. And I, I didn't know what to say. It embarrassed me. And I said, mm -hmm. well, James, I, I'm sorry. I don't even know what to say. And then I got mad. 
And then he goes, mm. no, I'm really, he said, you know what? He said, I was reading in the book of Isaiah this morning. And he said, take the chains from around your neck and move on. And he goes, brother, it's time for you to move on. I'll see you. I got to go. And he hung up. I want to bite a nail into. I'm so mad. And then I start thinking, I spent a decade with this guy and he loves me. And that's why he called me. And I tell everybody I needed the nudge. Well, he pushed me off the cliff. He didn't give me a nudge. That's right. But you know what? My life changed that day. I got over it. I'm like, he is right. I have got to pull myself up. I got to set this down and I've got to move on. Well, that's what we have to do in our lives today. We get knocked down. We get knocked down. We get knocked down. It's not important that what's important is, is you get up one more time, then you got knocked down. And that's what I had to do with the wreck. That's what I had to do with other situations that were in my life. I would not have had that nudge or push off the cliff had I not invested my time in a group of men that care about me. And I don't care if you join a group. I don't care if you start a group, but you got to get in a group. It doesn't matter to me. There's pitfalls both ways, right? You can start a group, and if you don't know what you're doing, it'll just take you longer to figure it out. If you join a group, you know, it'll take you longer to get to know the people. But the important thing is, let me tell you a couple of don'ts. Don't join it with a family member, first of all. Don't Mm. join it with a business partner. Get with a group of guys that are trusted advisors, that are non-biased, that have the same aspiration, goals, and determination that you have to move the needle forward. It doesn't matter if you make $10,000 a year or a jillion dollars a year. Every All these groups are different. Listen, I'll never catch up with Dave Ramsey in 10 lifetimes. He's making a trillion dollars a month, right? And so there's no way for me to catch up with him, but it doesn't matter. Right. What matters is, is that we're men of character. We have high integrity. We have morals. We have values. We have a mission, vision and value statement. We know what we want to do and we need the help of the group in order to obtain it. That's what we need to do. And when you get those kind of minds together in a room, you challenge each other. You give resources, you give encouragement, you edify one another, you share, you study you are absolutely going for it. And that's what I want. In Iron Sharpens Iron, I don't have pansies in my group. You don't last long. If you have a thin (laughs) backbone, you don't last long in there. You just don't because we're going for it. We have accountability tool. Every week we answer 10 questions. How do you rank one to 10 in these 10 categories? Keeps it top of mind. See, we're going for it. We're changing lives. Guys are getting better. They're accomplishing their dreams. They're accomplishing their goals because they have 10 people they meet with on a weekly basis, and they're going to go to heights that most people want because they subject themselves to the scrutiny of others. So so powerful. Hey, I love mastermind groups. I'm not trying to sell you on my group. I'm just saying as a whole, you look at Carnegie. You know, you look at what he did with it. You know, there were so many very, very successful people. They attribute their success to their mastermind. Because, well, they're smart people, right? When you're left to yourself, first of all, isolation is a very dangerous place to be. Greg wrote a book called The Enemies of Excellence, and isolation is number five, I believe, in the book. And it's a... Salsa Celli? Yeah. 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 He's awesome. I just interviewed him in the community. He's a great guy. Uh, But he talks about isolation. See, we don't... As entrepreneurs, we can feel that sense of loneliness. We can be isolated at times. That mastermind gives you an outlet to be able to overcome that. And so, yeah, get get in a group, whatever you do, get in a group. That's so great. Aaron, I want to talk about environment as well. Do you find that where the group meets makes a difference? Um, Do you structure your environments in a specific way? In other words, do you find it's key to get out of the house, uh, have a specific place to meet every time? Is an inspirational environment help? Is it about minimizing distractions? What are your thoughts on location? Yeah, there's a couple of absolutes, and then there's some things that I don't think matters. There's a couple of absolutes. First of all, you've got to have a central focus. And we do that with books. We've read hundreds of books. There's always an assignment. And all it does is gets the conversation going, and then you go from there. If you don't have a central focus, some curriculum or a book or something, guys get together and they want to tell about the golf story or the biggest fish they just caught or, you know, whatever, the NFL football, and they'll waste a lot of time on that. But if you come together and you read a great book, couple of questions, you know, to the group, it gets the conversation started in the right direction, right? Because we can talk about all that other stuff for five minutes, but we really need to get on with growing. For me, initially, I thought it was best to be in person. And my attitude towards that is changing a little bit. And I'll tell you why. 
I told you earlier that I had to leave at six in the morning. I drove to Dave's office. You know, it's 45 minutes from my house to Franklin from Hendersonville. And then we met and then everybody said their goodbyes, got back in the car, got in traffic and came back. So I burn up four hours for an hour and a half conversation, right? Well, when you do it virtually, first of all, you and I can say we have high character, integrity, values, morals. We have all that. And it doesn't matter if you're where you're at or it matters where I'm at. We're in this conference room together. We're seeing each other. We're sitting around a conference table with the 10 guys. We're on, we're off, an hour, you're done. The other thing is, is I have found that men tend to have a shield up. The veil doesn't come down in person as quick as it does online. Because when I'm in Nashville and you're, I don't even know where you're at. Where are you at? I'm just outside of Philadelphia right now. Okay, you're in Philly. So I can say, hey, you don't even know anybody in my circle. So I can be more vulnerable, transparent. I can be more honest with you. And then over time, you develop that friendship and that camaraderie that comes with live meetups. And we do those twice a year just to give us that sense. So I don't think that's important necessarily as much. Where I do find that people really struggle with being totally transparent and honest, and I want to talk about that in a second, is in their own community. Mm-hmm. Because you're with Billy and and your wife and her his wife are good girlfriends, and Billy goes home and tells Susan, and Susan tells your wife, and next thing you know, you're hearing about what you just was sharing, you know, from at the local Dairy Queen, you know, from somebody else's wife. So for that reason, I like the anonymity of being able to be in other cities. I see that guys will be more honest faster, right? Sure. The other thing is, is where most people struggle is they want everybody to think they've got it together. That's just normal. Like if I expose my weakness, then he's not going to respect me as much. And there's nothing further from the truth. The quicker we can be transparent, we can let the veil down, we can show areas that we're weak, that's when we get more help, right? Then I can help you. Then I can say, hey, that's not a problem for me. It's not an issue for me. And let me strengthen you. Let me give you the resources. Let me help you. But where I'm weak is maybe in this area and you go, oh, dude, I got that. I mean, here, let me help you. And then you see you get stronger a lot faster, the quicker you can get to a point where you're totally transparent and honest. And it just takes time. And I'm seeing these groups, the faster they get to that point, hey, we're all a bunch of knuckleheads, right? We're just trying to figure it out, right? But we put on this facade. And then later you, you're you alone and you go, man, I need help there, but I can't tell them. You know, I'm going to be looked at as though I'm not as smart or, you know, I'm just saying be honest, be transparent, and you'll grow exponentially as a result of it. Absolutely. I was with a gentleman uh, last couple of days, uh, it was at a uh, an event. Sat at dinner with a guy who had grown his business, uh, you know, several hundred percent this yeah. past year. Yeah. And I asked, "What was you know? What's one of the what changed? Right? What was a key factor?" And he said, "I got into a mastermind group, and that was the deciding factor that made the business pop." It was the der- let me tell you why, John. Let's just say for an example, we'll just use two or three examples. And uh, I assume you're married. So now we're talking about your wife. We're talking about being a servant leader to her, to your children, your faith, your relationships, your career, your finances. If I ask you every week, hey, how are you doing with your wife on a one to 10? And I'm a two. Well, after about three weeks of twos, I'm going to be like, where's the date night? Yeah. I mean, what? where's the love note? Where's the little gift? Where are the flowers? Where are you spending time sitting on the couch having coffee with her, really getting intimate with your conversations? How are you planning out your life with your wife? And you go, I'm not doing that. Well, why aren't you doing it? Right. Well, I just haven't done it. Well, you're lazy. That's why you haven't done it, and you need to do it. And then you start doing it, and your wife starts liking it. It's like, hey, now we're getting getting somewhere, right? Then Your children, same way. I'm working, 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 and you come home one day with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers, yeah. and your kid doesn't even know you. You're none of the ball games. You're none of the recitals. You're not at home at, for dinner at night. And you walk in one day and the kid, they're off into something else because something's going to get their attention. That's right. And now you got all these problems. And it's because you've had your hind end at work and you're, you should have been at home. And so I want people to have an all-encompassing life 
holistically. I want you to be very successful financially, but don't forget that commitment you made to your wife. And don't forget you're a dad to those kids. Don't forget those things. Don't forget your community, your civic responsibilities. And when I hold you accountable that you go, man, he's going to call me on the carpet. And I've got, yeah, I am because you're dropping the ball and you do it and then it works. And then you're successful and you're like, man, now I'm hitting it out of the park. That's right. It's the accountability. It's the biggest tool. Ma- massive shifts when you have the right person calling you to the carpet. I'll never forget sitting down for a lunch with a friend years ago. And this is a person I really respected. We had a great base in our friendship. She had, uh, She's a doctor and very smart. We're having this conversation. I said, hey, uh, her name is Paulette. I said, Paulette, what's something that I could improve upon as a friend? And she thought about it. And then she responded, I think you could be a better listener. Yeah. And I joke now that I didn't hear a word she said, (laughs) which is ironic that she was telling me I needed to be a better listener, but I rejected her comment until, you know, I think that it just chipped away and broke through. And eventually I was, I thought she's totally right. I need to be a better listener. I need to, maybe that's why I ended up interviewing people was to become better at asking questions and listening. But having that feedback changed my life forever. It was one comment yeah. in one conversation and, and the right person sharing that made a difference. You know, when it, I tell people this all the time, I said, we're always waiting our turn to talk. Yeah. You need to stop doing that. Stop waiting your turn to talk and fully engage people. You ever been totally. in a restaurant, John, and maybe somebody new, every time the door opens, they look over there, you know, or they're looking around the restaurant and they're seeing who's there and you, you're duck, you know, you're like, Hey, I'm over here, you know, yeah, yeah. fully engage people and takes practice to do. But people tell me now on an ongoing basis, I said, tell me my weaknesses, tell me my strengths. And they said, you really engage people. I said, cause I really care about what you're saying. That's right. Totally. Right? And the only way I can serve you is to listen. I went to buy a car recently, and I told the guy, I want a blue car with brown leather interior. And he goes, I've got this car you want, but it's red. Come over here and let me show it to you. I said, I want a red one. I want a blue one with a brown leather interior. (laughs) He goes, this one over here is on sale. I said, I don't, I want a blue car with a brown leather interior. And he kept trying to make the sale rather than to satisfy me. If he'd have got on the phone and found me a blue car with a brown leather, I would have wrote him a check, Right. right? We're right. too busy trying to make the sale. We need to try to add value mm-hmm. instead of making the sale. When you do that, you'll make more sales than you ever dream possible. Aaron, you just reminded me that when I'm interviewing Larry Hagner, our good friend of the Good Dad Project, right? Our mutual friend. And I'm, on, this is, I'm newer to the podcast and I have these questions written out and I really want to ask him some great questions. So there's this one moment when I'm like looking at what question I want to ask him. And then he asks me a question and I totally don't know what to say because I didn't hear him. Because I was, I was thinking about what I wanted to ask next. And I'm learning always in my life the power of being being fully engaged and not thinking about what you're going to say next, but just be present with people. So I learned that right here in the podcasting world. Hey, listen, (laughs) Carol Dweck wrote a great book called Mindset. Mm. And I would like for your listeners to read that book. I don't get one quarter out of it. There's two or three books that have really been impactful. We either have a growth or a fixed mindset. And I want to encourage people to get out of the fixed mindset, get a growth mindset, yes. and it will be amazing what it'll do for your life. And one of those things is, is fully engaging people. So it just helps us to be better listeners. Oh, excellent. Thank you for that. We'll link to that in the, in the notes as well, Aaron. Aaron, um, I know I want to transition here. Uh, we only got you for a couple more minutes. Thank you for being uh, here with us today. Yeah, yeah, um, on on a, a bit of a deeper topic, and we touched on this earlier today, and I know you have experience in your life on the topic of death and something that in the Front Row Foundation, we, of course, are working with and serving individuals who in some ways have been told, hey, you have a certain amount of time to live or you know, you should start doing the things you want to do right now. How do you process the fact that we all are going to leave this world? Um, how does it motivate you today or, mm-hmm. or you know, how do you feel about death? You know, really, uh, 2001 changed my perspective completely because I thought up to that point I was invincible, right? I'm sure. never going to die. You know, I'm young, everything I touch turns to gold and I'm going to live forever. And then that day I thought, You know what? That could have been me crossing the street and a bus, you know, run over me or something. And what legacy would I have lived? And then I started thinking about it. I said, people would have said, well, he was successful at an early age and he had a nice house and a beach place and, you know, he had a little bit of money. 
But then I started thinking when my dad died, people stood in line for an hour and a half for six and a half hours to get up to me. Every person that came through that line said, your dad's life impacted me in this way. Your dad was always smiling. Your dad was always encouraging. Your dad always had candy for the kids. Your dad always this or that. Grown men, 75 years old, crying. Children, 15 years old, crying. Not one person in six and a half hours said anything like, your dad had a nice boat, your dad had a nice car, your dad had a nice house. See, it's the relationships that matter. If we can ever get it to a point of realizing that our whole life is revolved around relationships and the value of those, we'll stop chasing the tangible possessions The second thing, the way I handle death is that I'm a Christian and I know that this life is temporal for me here. Eternity, I'm going to be spending with Christ. And so I know at some point I'm going to die. None of us get out alive, right? At some point, we've got to make the decisions today what it is that we're living for long term. For me, it's my faith. I'm a Christian. So I don't want to go. I have a lot of things that I want to accomplish here. I have grandkids here. I have children. I have relationships. But I know at some point I'm going to be checking out, right? I want to live every day like it's my last because it may be. We don't know. A good friend of mine just got a report two weekends ago. He's got bone cancer. He's 61 Uh, years old. He's been preparing for retirement his whole life. He's even in my offices. I sublease a space to him, one of my best friends. And he's like, you know, it is what it is, and I'm going to have to deal with it. We don't know when we're going to get that news, That's right. right? And so every day I want to be sure that I reach out and that I live the way I'm supposed to. I want to edify and lift up others. I want to be the husband to my wife. I want to be the father to my children and the grandpa to my grandchildren that I should be. I don't want to have any regrets. I don't want to lay in bed and go, oh, man, I should have done this. No, I want to do that. Whatever that is, I want to do it each and every day. Aaron, thank you for sharing that. We've got to let you go in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I want to get your gut reaction to 10 questions. So this is right from the heart. Sure. You, I have not told you what these questions are. Oh, you are. haven't. I'm a nervous wreck. So, <laughs> so uh, oh, oh, here we go. 10 okay. questions, gut reaction. So this is one word or one sentence. Okay. All right. Now, because you've talked about books, let me start with that. What's one book that should be mandatory for all humans to read? How to Win Friends and Influence People by Carnegie. Excellent book. What does it mean to be fully alive? Yeah, Ken Davis wrote a great book on that. He's in my mastermind, actually, Ken Davis is, and he wrote a book to be fully alive. And I think it's what I said earlier is to live each day like it could be your last and have no regrets at the end. Excellent. What problem do you most want to solve in the world? I want to help ordinary men become extraordinary. Who are you a raving fan of? Dan Miller. 48 Days to the Work You Love. He's been my personal hero for two decades now. Excellent. One to check out for sure. What is the first happiest memory that you can recall in your life? Yeah, when I married Robin 36 Uh, years ago. Ah, that's great. I can't wait to meet Robin one day. She's awesome. And your whole family. When you do get sad, and guessing that you do because you're human, what do you get sad about? Yeah, normally it's not business things, quite honestly. Uh, Normally it's just family things because I'm so involved with my family and it's a lot easier for me to get sad with situations that are not going well. They always say you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. And that's a lot of truth in that. So family situations for me tend to make me sadder than business. If you had to pick, pick one person to switch brains with for one day, who comes to mind? Oh my goodness. (laughs) Warren Buffett would be pretty good. I would, like, a great to, I would like to have his for a day. It would be great. Yeah, you'd make a lot of really good decisions on that one day for sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's something fun that you've collected in your lifetime? Yeah, I'm not a big collector. I would say, what does I collect? I don't you, collect. I'm you collected collect- pawn shops at one point. I did collect businesses. <laughs> so we'll go with that. All right, very good. If your 20-year-old self walked into the room right now, and let me, let me back up, hold on. Yeah, if your 20-year-old self walked into the room right now and met you today, what would they be most pleasantly surprised by? Uh, humility. Excellent. And last question, what live performance, concert, sporting event, anything would you want to see front row and they have to still be playing or performing now? 
Yeah, you know, the most enjoyable that I've ever gone to for the exhilaration was uh, the Titans when they went to the Super Bowl. Uh, that was really, really awesome. I would have to say the Eagles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that years ago, and that would be an awesome experience. The band. Yep. Okay, very good. Aaron, I want to uh, I want to let you go. You're on to your next call. Thank you so much for your time today. I want to also say thank you for helping to shape a world that my boys are growing up in. And you are doing some incredible work. And I hope everybody goes and checks out your site. It's viewfromthetop.com. That's correct, yeah. Excellent. And uh, I would highly recommend and encourage anybody to join any of the programs that you have going on, your masterminds, your community. Anything else that you'd want to say about that before we sign off? Yeah, I've uh, got a little gift for your listeners. And I would just like to say that if you'll go to viewfromthetop.com forward slash front row, all in lowercase letters, there's three documents that I've taken the price off of. I'm going to give them to your listeners. Ah, thank you. One is a personal assessment. One is what do I want and steps to a productive day. I promise you it will be the catalyst to help you live a successful and significant life. Aaron, thank you so much, my friend. I can't wait to talk with you again down the road. All my best to you and your family. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, John. I enjoyed it, man. Thanks for having me. Take care. See you, buddy. All righty. I hope you enjoyed that show with Aaron Walker. Make sure to get the free gifts by going to viewfromthetop.com slash front row. Again, that's viewfromthetop.com slash front row. That will get you the goodies. And I uh, really uh, had such a great chat with him today. I'm going to challenge you once again, as I shared in the intro, to ask yourself, who would benefit from this show? You know, who would really enjoy listening to Aaron? One of the greatest gifts we give to those we love and care about is the introduction to another great human being and the wisdom that they are sharing. So check them out, viewfromthetop.com slash Front Row. Hope you enjoyed today's show. We'll talk to you again on the next episode of The Front Row Factor. Adios for now. That's all for this episode of The Front Row Factor. To discover more simple and effective ways to lead a fearless front row life, please visit frontrowfactor.com and subscribe to John's Four Minutes in the Front Row, where he shares quick stories from real life experiences. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope our show inspires you to live big, give big, and experience life to the fullest. See you next time on The Front Row Factor.